Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. I'm Lisa and I'm here today with my guest Venkat. Hey Lisa, I'm here with my guest Lisa. Welcome to Scorpio Season. And I believe we hit a milestone today, right? A hundred subscribers on YouTube. Yeah, that's right. We have a hundred YouTube subscribers. So just check that right. out. It's exciting. Uh, we're yes. in the triple digits, yeah. Yep, one step at a time, we will convert the world to Scorpio season. That's true. All right. Um, cool. So uh, the letter that we're talking about today is J. Uh, do you have a snack that you're eating? Uh, yes. So I was going to just have, like, put some jam on a cracker, but that felt like a cop-out. So what I have is a drink called Jaljeera. So Jaljeera is uh, cumin, tamarind, a uh, bunch of other spices. So it's a classic Indian summer drink. So it's two J's. J is uh, water and Jira is the Indian word for cumin. So two J's. So that's my drink. What's your snack? Well, um, I'm eating I'm eating jerky. I make beef jerky. So I made some beef jerky last week. All right. Yeah. So we are both being super ethno-nationalist. I'm drinking an Indian thing. You're eating a classic Texas thing. <laughs> yep. Actually, yes, this is true. All right. <laughs> so we have... Uh, two topics to discuss today under J. One is jokes and jokers, and the other is uh, Jane Jacobs. So let's start with uh, Jane Jacobs. Are you a Jane Jacobs expert, Lisa? Yes, I would put myself in the Jane Jacobs expert category. All right, and me, I think I've uh, read her Wikipedia page and generally know who she is, but I haven't read anything by her. So I'm gonna put myself as uh, knows very little and you as an expert. So we are in this quadrant today. I think that's the fourth quadrant, yeah. Yeah, what Lisa knows and me is bad. Okay, so jokes and jokers. Uh, uh, hmm. I think we can be very self-congratulatory on jokes. I think we are both pretty funny people. Jokers is uh, kind of... So joker as in Batman and the Joker. Yeah, hmm. I think I'm not an expert in a comic book fan sense, but I'm a fan of the Joker as a villain. I actually don't, I would, I don't know that much about the Joker. I've definitely seen like that one old, it's not old, but that there was like a Batman movie a long time ago that came out with- Jack Joker. Nicholson, the, Jack Nicholson was the first Joker, right? And then there was Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger, I've seen the Heath Ledger one. <laughs> okay, now you're making me feel old. So you call Heath Ledger Joker the old movie. For me, old movie is the Jack Nicholson Joker. That was 19, uh, 88 or 89, I think. So the Tim Burton movies. Yeah. Oh. All right. So uh, I would say we, we can do some self-congratulation here. And we just both, uh, yeah. Let's give ourselves a really high first quadrant rating Great. here. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's where we are. And I'll stop sharing. And here we go. Uh, cool. Cool. Okay. So um, the... Yeah, okay, so the, um, we're talking about Jane Jacobs, right? Yep. All right, what do we want to talk, where do you want to start with Jane Jacobs? Like, <laughs> uh, Let's start with an explainer. I think I spent the last episode um, in sort of mansplaining mode, so you can be in woman'splaining mode this time. So explain Jane Jacobs to me. <laughs> I feel like, okay, but that's, I feel like the mansplainer versus woman'splainer, I don't think that's a binary. I don't think that there's like a, I don't think there's like a woman equivalent of, mansplaining. I just, I don't think it exists. Um, we'll have to think about that in W. Yeah, we can talk okay. about that in W or M, M okay. you know, either one. Um, All right. Yeah. Okay. So Jane Jacobs was a, um, I think the easiest way to describe her is a writer and an activist who um, spent a lot of time in New York City. And then later in life, she moved to Toronto. So she was a neat, it's kind of funny because Torontoites very much claim her as their own. Like Toronto as a city is very proud that they Jane Jacobs called it her home. Um, but I think if you talk to New Yorkers about it, like I feel like they feel like New Jane Jacobs belongs to them. So that's kind of, um, I don't know. I just think it's funny that there's like these two different cities that like very much feel like mm -hmm. she's theirs. Um, anyway, so she was a, she was a, she wrote most of her books from, I want to say, Gosh, 
I'm not good with like exact dates, but she was active in writing from I want to say like the 19 mm, 40s, 50s <laughs> for sure. So maybe like 1950s to like her last book I want to say came out in 2002. So okay. Um, half a century of writing. She oh, she would put out I want to say like six or seven books over that period. So she averaged about a book a decade. Wow. Uh, but her most famous one is the Death and Life of American Cities, right? When was that? Okay. I believe 16... that was her first book. I thought it came out in the sixties, like early okay. sixties. Um, I think. Yeah, I know her like Systems and Survival and like Nature of Something came out in. Um, Nature of Economies came out in, like, I want to say the 80s. Um, and then, anyway, so, like, she wrote, so her first book, so, <laughs> it's fun. So, Jane Jacobs is, like, most well-known, and most people know about her because of Death and Life of American Cities. So, she mm -hmm. tends to get put into the urbanist um, category. And actually, so, like, I, the story of how she, so, like, her background is she, um, she was like an editor. She worked at a bunch of newspapers for a while. She worked at the, um, uh, gosh, arch some architectural review thing that did a lot of writing on urban stuff. Um, before that, I think she worked at basically what was like the American propaganda like magazine that they were trying to like sell to like Soviet, like the Soviet Union. So oh. they were like producing an American magazine about life in America that was targeted at like the Soviet Union. This was like during the Cold War. So she worked basically for the, I thought, I believe the name of that like government office was the OSS or whatever. It was kind of like, okay. um, kind of like the CIA, but more of a like late and like intellectualized, like they produced content. Side oh yeah, of was this the Office of Strategic Services? I think I've yes. come across yeah. the acronym in other contexts. Okay. Great. Right. And I think Julia Childs was part of the OSS, her or her husband also, kind of like a random thing. Um, anyway, so Jane oh. Jacobs like worked for them for a while. Um, and then she ended up working for this architectural firm. And then at some point, um, her boss was supposed to give a lecture on at like a urbanism conference but he couldn't make it and so he asked Jane to go and give a talk instead and so she went and gave a presentation and I believe the presentation that she gave was basically um I want to say it was like five to ten things it was kind of like a listicle of um things that she noticed about like urbanism like urban thoughts she had on urbanism basically mm -hmm. and it was like completely well received and everyone was like really impressed with like the novelty of her thought process um she ended up getting contracted to write a longer form newspaper article for it um I don't remember exactly which publication that went out in but that was like kind of her start and then I want to say either like the Rockefeller Foundation or one of those like there's like a grant foundation that like gives mm -hmm. money to writers like Robert Caro who did the power broker also did this program where they like pay you money for a year to like go and write your book. Um, oh, that's so interesting. So both of them got the same fellowship, even though they were in a way on opposite sides, right? Because Robert Caro was oh, Robert no. Moses. Robert Moses is not Robert Caro. I know, but Robert Caro was the biographer and the mm -hmm. book is kind of like, I don't know, Pro I mean, Moses, right? I haven't I read that book either. So at all, no. Okay. However, no, it's not, not very. No, that's not a Pro Moses. Oh, book okay. okay. Then I can totally have that wrong. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Very wrong. <laughs> okay. uh, you should fix that. Um, I feel like you're showing off your West Coast um, roots here with like your ignorance as to these particular. Well, I started on the East Coast, so I'm actually showing off my anti big fat book bias. Like just looking at a really fat book intimidates me to the point that I gave up trying to read it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. It was like a month. It took me a month. It's on like every bookshelf of every, new, every person I know in New York though. Yeah. Whether or not they've all read it, it's like questionable that everyone has it. I don't know. Um, yeah anyways um okay yeah anyway so she did this like basically it's like a writer so the Rockefeller. i want to it might not be the Rockefeller. it might be something else don't quote mm -hmm. me on this but she basically got some grant money because of the article that she put out to go and produce a book and death and life in american cities was out was is what became like the output of that and it um yeah it was like very aimed at so 
Jane Jacobs is fun in terms of the context. Like it, once you understand the context of what was going on in urbanism at the time that Jane Jacobs was producing her stuff, it's like actually a really interesting look at the um, forces that were shape, reshaping American cities throughout like the 50s. Um, and actually like a lot of that was driven by this character named Robert Moses, who was the head of the parks department in New York City for decades. Um, so Robert Moses really pioneered the um, use of federal and state funds to build large highway projects, like the parkways. So that's actually the reason why the, um, why the roads in New York City are called parkways. We call them highways now, but there's like, you know, parkway is because it came from the parks department. Oh, I did um, not know that. Huh. Yeah, so like the, um, the parks department was run by Robert Moses and he had pretty much absolute iron fist control over what the parks department mm -hmm. did. And he had this grand vision that he was gonna build these parkways that would connect the parks together and that people could get into their cars and go on a leisurely drive down the parkway to get to his parks. Um, and so he used his influence um, and some legislation that he had written. Sorry, this is like, I'm really off topic, it's fine, I'm keep going. Um, anyway, so he, like, he had written, because I think it's really interesting. Um, so Robert Moses, before he became the Parks Commissioner, had worked for this um, really well-loved politician called, I think, Al Smith, um, who was governor of New York for a certain period of time. And during that time, Robert Moses, who grew up and came out of like the progressive um, movement in uh, politics in New York City, um, basically became an aide for Al Smith. So he's very close to the governor mm -hmm. of a, a really democratic, but um, Al Smith, I believe, was kind of a Tammany Hall product. So he was like basically like part of the boss machine. Um, he ended up, anyways, Robert Moses, while he was working under Al Smith, ended up getting into the New York state laws, the first um, idea of eminent domain. So the way that he did this is really ingenious. And this is what Robert Caro talks about in The Power mm -hmm. Broker. But um, basically there was this old definition of what eminent domain was. And it was like back in the 1800s, right? So Robert Moses is doing this, let's say in like the 1920s, which is around the time that like the progressive movement was really big and strong. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so he's like writing legislation and he goes back to the 1800s and finds a definition of eminent domain that no one really knows. So back before Robert Moses started re, re like, invigorated this like idea of what eminent domain was um it used to be people didn't really have this idea that the government could come and take land from people for public good right which is kind of the whole yeah. idea behind it but there was this old definition back in the 1800s that did have it so when he wrote the legislation he used the words eminent domain referenced the like article back in the 1800s that had the definition he wanted into the thing but no one when they went through and read the law, so like, you know, you send out the bill as it's written, not a lot of people went back to look up what the definition was. So everyone looked at eminent domain as like, I know what this means. <laughs> because it had a meaning in popular context. And so it got passed into law. No one actually knew that this had been passed into law until Robert Moses ended up in his position where he wanted to build highways or redo, reshape the face of New York City, the landscape of New York City. Um, and so he pulled out this law that had gotten passed and then used it to get all the land that he needed to put in new highways and to start setting up these huh. new public housing complexes. So when Jane Jacobs started writing about urbanism, New York City was going, had been, I want to say under like the power of new Moses's like bulldozer, so to speak, for a couple, I want to say at least a decade. Um, and Jane Jacobs had been in New York City kind of writing about the city and observing it. She's like, her big thing was like eyes on the street, like citizen mm -hmm. observer. Like you just go out and you see what you see and that is what you make conclusions and insights based on what's going on in the world and then like write them down. Um, there's also like, so Jane Jacobs can also be seen. So, so Robert Moses was making big public works, right? Like big highways. Um, this was also the time period where like public housing was like a first thing that, like they were doing. Um, and the way that they- oh, So this would be, if, if, when was this, 1960s, right? 
I want to say it was 1950s. Oh, okay. So not LBJ. So this would be uh, Eisenhower. I wouldn't know. Oh, okay. But maybe. Right. Um, uh, the reason I ask is um, LBJ was behind the Great Society stuff and uh, all these sort of expensive mm -hmm. public works kind of like at the federal level. Uh, right. But okay. But yeah. I think, right. But I think that Margaret Moses was the prototype for what then got promoted to the public level, to the federal oh, level. Okay, okay. This is my oh, theory. Better. This okay. is the least a theory of how this happened, but I think so. Like New York City was like ground zero for a lot of this like big city public work isms. Like uh, Robert Moses's parkways predate the international or the interstate highway system. Okay. And I think that he ended up like he ended up going to Congress because he was a powerful politician that had a lot of contacts and like convincing the federal government to pay for um, road projects, which. I don't have any, I haven't actually looked up the history of it, but I like, I would not be surprised if the work that Robert Moses did in terms of paving, paved the way for the interstate highway program is because it became yeah. the thing that the government yeah. paid for. So going back to the eminent domain thing, that's an interesting hack. And since you say that the definition he used uh, was from the 1800s, I imagine the sort of clever part of the shifting definition was uh, that the 1800s eminent domain was mainly used to claim land for like the transcontinental railroad and things like that. So through largely empty kind of like uh, and Native American type territories and small towns and applying it to a, a 20th century developed city with lots more complex urban stuff going on would have been the sort of bait and switch uh, move over there, right? And it makes yeah. sense that then the highway system also could benefit from that same sort of bait and switch because in the 20th century, building a highway system meant going through like uh, complex cities instead of like big countryside. So it would have been much harder that way. Okay, I think mean, I kind of get the cleverness of the hack there. Right, yeah, okay, so New York City, they're like, and so part of the way that it worked is that they'd go into a neighborhood and declare it as blighted and then tear it down and build this like big monstrosity. Mm -hmm. And so Jane Jacobs like was working at this newspaper and the way that the newspaper was like spinning it. And like, also this was the time period where like Le Corbusier, like the um, French designer would like, was building buildings that look good for highways from airplanes, yeah. if that makes sense. Like it was all this like sleek, big, um, what was the other, like city beautiful or garden city kind of yeah, like yeah. lots of parks. So this is high so, modernism, like, right? This is the high modern, authoritarian high modernism that James Scott talks about. So Le Corbusier, and yeah. his works are sort of the prime example of that style. Yes, exactly. Yes. So all this was happening, right? So it's kind of like the Corbusier was like sort of like the architect. I don't know if this is exactly true. Um, but but that style of like, oh, we're gonna like mass plan architects like tear down this like blighted, very difficult, messy, chaotic part of the city and build these clean, beautiful parks with like housing for the people and it'll be great. And Jane Jacobs came in and at some point saw what was happening. It took her a while to see it and was like, no, this is terrible. This is destroying the fabric of the city. And that's what Death and Life of American City is, is really a reaction to, um, was this like process of like, of high modernism, like mm -hmm. the destruction of the city fabric that high modernism was like wrecking onto or bringing to New York City. Yeah. So um, it's kind of interesting because I think in the process of going from Le Corbusier's work in, I guess, the 1920s to what you're talking about in maybe the 30s or 40s, I guess, whenever, or 50s, I don't know when the range was, but it's like the vision kind of shrunk down where Le Corbusier and his uh, era, they were building entire cities on like uh, empty land. So Brasilia and places like that, it. right? Yeah. Uh, but New York, uh, the same philosophy of like, I guess, clear cutting the existing thing you know, was shrunk down to the level of a neighborhood uh, under yes. the way Moses applied it. Okay, yes. that's kind of interesting. Yes. Yeah, but like, so, I mean, so Robert, this is more of a Robert Caro thing, but Caro goes into the like millions of people that Robert Moses's bulldozers displaced. Like he raised entire neighborhoods and destroyed like social fabrics and like all that. And Robert Caro does a good job of, of covering that. Jane Jacobs covers it more from like a, like, has definitely an urbanist perspective on it. Like these cities, like these things that we're building are not good for people. Um, and this is why, and it's like a really good and interesting book that like goes into, um, anyway, so that was her first book. Um, 
I actually, it's been a while since I read it. I don't actually remember like what the format or framework of it is, but she, I think she's got a couple of different precepts that she walks through about what makes good and interesting cities and really goes into this idea that like this tear down the neighborhood and build one new thing is bad. What you really want is you want incrementalism. You want more localized control at the neighborhood level. Um, and she ended up, so it, she ended up getting her neighborhood. She lived in the West Village in New York City at the time. And Robert Moses tried to, basically, I think they tried to like, he had like a couple things he tried to do around that neighborhood. He was trying to build a, a highway across that part of Manhattan, which would have basically cut out like most of the West Village, Chinatown, Little Italy, all the way across like the east side. He was going to like bulldoze it all and put in a highway across there. Um, which I don't, he didn't succeed at. Um, I think part of, I can't remember if like Jane Jacobs' neighborhood getting marked as blight was part of that. Or they were, anyways, they were trying to like do something to her neighborhood to like bulldoze it or change it in some big way. Um, it might have even been like Washington Square Park, which is like in the heart of like downtown Manhattan or like lower Manhattan. Um, anyway, so she and her neighborhood organized to defeat Robert Moses's plan and they were actually one of the first and maybe the only neighborhood that successfully stopped Robert Moses from like raising uh -huh. their neighborhood. Um, and she's got some really interesting anecdotes about her process about that whole process in the book Death and Life of American Cities. Like one of my, one of the things that is to me really memorable is how they they organized to stop. So Washington Square Park has used to have a traffic circle in the middle of it. So traffic used to actually flow underneath. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the park, but there's like a big arch. And cars used to, and like there's a big arch and in the middle there's a big fountain and cars mm -hmm. used to go around the fountain and go through the arch. Like it was a throughway. I know the traffic was really bad. It wasn't a great place to hang out because there's cars in it all the time. Now it's a really nice, like closed off, like square, like, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a plaza now. It's like all the way plaza and you can walk around the whole thing. And it's a great park to hang out at. It's super, like, it's always full of people. Um, but anyway, it's like, so they basically, they managed to get Washington Square Park close to traffic, which is a big deal. And the, uh, like, the opponents to this plan, like, you know, the city dudes, are always dudes, the city dudes who wanted <laughs> the traffic to, like, continue flowing through the park for whatever reason, um, you know, it's always like, well, traffic's so bad, it's only going to get worse. And then they succeeded at closing the park, and traffic actually got better. And, like, so Jane Jacobs in her book is, like, if they really cared, they would do a study to figure out where the traffic went. But they don't actually <laughs> care. Like, they're not actually, her whole point is, like, they're not actually, like, their whole thing wasn't actually about the traffic. It was about some amount of exertion of control. Yep. So like, clearly there's some, she's, like, she, she doesn't say that so much, but she's, like, clearly something else is going on here because this is an interesting, like, this is an interesting phenomenon. If they were interesting and, like, involve people that were running the government like they would probably investigate it but clearly did they not. did they end up investigating no. Other? no no it disappeared no they just like they pushed it on the rug it was just like oh we guess it wasn't it's, it's interesting thing. because uh, what you're describing is the reverse of um, a different paradox in graph theory which says that if you take like a graph where traffic is flowing yeah. and you try to improve traffic by adding a link Yes, it can actually, it actually make traffic sense. worse, right? So this yes. is the flip side of that. Right. Removing a link actually made it better. Yes, so that's exactly. That's interesting. And I think that that research that you're citing came out later okay. um, and is like a good, and I think that this Washington Square Park thing is exactly a good example of what you described. Like you remove mm -hmm. links from the graph and it flows better. Um, but none of that was known and no one did any studies <laughs> yeah. at the time was her point. Um, anyway, so like that was like, that's actually like, okay, so that... This book, Death and Life and All of Her Urbanism, is what Jane Jacobs is known for. It is like what's made her famous. Like, you know, people do. So when I lived in New York City, I, I studied to be a tour guide with this really great, like, organization um, called MASS, which is, I don't remember. Like, so like walking like, tours of downtown and stuff? And yeah, tour my, my, tour, my tour street was the 34th Street tour, which is really fun because it's got, um, it's like got the Empire State Building, the Hearst Building, um, Macy's, and like that whole like kind of department store yeah. row. Penn uh, Station is on 34th as well, right? Penn Station's over there too, which was, so usually you start kind of, I mean, the cool thing about the tours, they let you do whatever you wanted. So like, 
it was really super like it was a super fun thing like it was mm-hmm. very much a research project they're like okay here's like where your tour is but anyways their whole thing was they were very like pro jane jacobs like urbanists we're urbanists because of jane jacobs um so everyone like i just finished reading a book last weekend that um i think it was glenn whale and um stephen something's radical markets okay um anyways in it they like they like they they like they mentioned jane jacobs once and the way that they like urbanist jane jacobs she's like Anyways, but it's, this book is an economics book, and that's important. Okay, so that's important. So it's like this book that I read the last weekend is written by economists um, about economist topics, and when they mention Jane Jacobs, they contextualize, contextualize her as this as an urbanist. Jane mm-hmm. Jacobs was not just an urbanist. I think, and her and she is on the record for saying that her best and most important work is for econ- like how the economy works, how economies of cities work. Oh, so the commerce and guardian uh, syndrome stuff, right? So um, yeah, yeah, the syndrome stuff actually, I think got so like if you go and you look through, I think at one point, and it's been a while, I should go back. It's been a couple of years, but if you go through and you look at like what citations of work her, like what cites her works, does that make sense? Like I think mm-hmm. death and life is probably the first. I think systems of survival, which is the syndrome stuff that you're talking mm-hmm. about, is probably the second. I think that more people have done work off of that than any of her other stuff. That does not um, surprise me because um, at a Wikipedia level of knowing about the systems of survival, that's the one I've actually cited in some of my blog posts. Uh, but before we move on to the that uh, syndrome stuff, a um, mm-hmm. uh, couple more sort of points on the urbanism stuff. Uh, so if I recall correctly, she was also a big proponent of density, or at least people cite her as like um, uh, an authority figure on why good density is a good thing. And I saw this a blog post like several years back when Richard Florida was still sort of popular and respected before he kind of lost credibility. But one of the concepts mentioned was called the Jacob's distance, which I think is, uh, uh, I don't know if she defined it, but somebody named it after her. But the Jacob's distance is how far can you walk in a neighborhood before you run into somebody else? And it struck me that um, that's very interesting now that we are social distancing and we're trying to make the Jacob's distance uh, <laughs> double or triple or whatever it is, right? Because that's yeah. the infection rate thing. And I was just uh, Googling her before um, we started talking and I saw some references to uh, the NIMBY movement and uh, sort of an attempt to cast Jane Jacobs as basically part of the NIMBY narrative, which um, I think could work. Like, was she, was Jane Jacobs a NIMBY? No. No? Okay. Jane Jacobs is all about local control, localized control. So, okay, so Jane Jacobs is about localized control, um, but she's also really into this idea of, like, diversity and, like, um, so she's, her, like, some of her tenants are, like, diversity of, like, types of buildings that are available. Like, a good mm-hmm. neighborhood will have, like, a good cross-section of new buildings versus old buildings. Um, and some of her rationale for that is that, um, in theory, older buildings will have cheaper rent. So that you'll have, like, a um, like the more diversity you have of uses and spaces that people can use, the different types of um, people and niches can yeah. like find themselves in that so like if there's an old building with cheaper rent and then you have newer buildings that like maybe have more amenities um she's really all about infill as well so like when you're building things you don't want to like tear up don't like tear the whole thing down at once and try to build like this master plan community but rather go and find places that have opportunity like a small empty lot that you can build cool interesting like five-story high-rise in or um and basically like more small organic lots of small little plans by a lot of people is better than big one big plan by a developer if that makes sense so okay so indirectly she would end up and statistically speaking if infill is sort of your philosophy and lots of experimentation and there's a finite budget of how much um, like square miles you have to work with it means you're naturally putting a cap size on the largest possible project because really large projects will use up too much of the sort of, I don't know, diversity potential, right? Like, uh, especially in a city like San Francisco with earthquake risk or something, unless you're really, really clever by building a really big high rise, it's probably not going to work within that sort of experimental portfolio thing. But I think you're right. Yeah, I don't think she comes across as like, like NIMBY is too simplistic a position. She would be sort of beyond that, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And like, I mean, I don't think that Jane Jacobs is a big fan of high rises because they're not very like street friendly. Like when you're a human on a street walking past, I mean, it depends on how they do like the, the, um, it depends on how the ground level retail is set up. Some large buildings do a good job of integrating the like street life with their first mm-hmm. level. But a lot of the ones in big downtowns are just like endless blocks of like concrete that you're walking past. Which yeah. Jane Jacobs is like not a fan of. That was not, that's not very human Those aren't like fun, interesting neighborhoods to find yourself in as a person. So since you're in Houston, I want to ask you a question about Houston versus New York, which you've lived in and San Francisco, which you've already lived in. So yeah. you know, I remember like this was a more than an, a couple of decades ago, maybe. But a friend of mine who used to work for McKinsey out of the Houston office, he mm-hmm. had this interesting observation that if you look at the price per square foot of real estate, it basically goes up as you get to the core of a city in a way that the heights of buildings end up being a poison distribution. So you should get like you know, approximate bell curve type thing, except the discrete version, the poison one. You should get that kind of curve where the tallest buildings are in the middle because that's the most expensive square footage. So you want to build up more. And as you go out, it should get shorter and shorter. And his point about Houston was, If you look at other natural kind of big cities, you will see an approximation of the distribution in heights. But if you look at Houston, you will see like lots of really tall buildings in the middle, like a Dirac Delta function and suddenly falling off. And his explanation for that was, this isn't actually a rational reflection of square footage price increasing towards the core. This is basically oil wealth trying to like basically show off. It's like um, architecture as like showing off. So you, and I think that, explanations egotistical architecture but i think that i think that most cities have egotistical architecture like that i think that like most skyscrapers are egotistical projects like but maybe oil wealth makes it more egotistical like look at dubai i mean the burj khalifa is the tallest in is it still the tallest no some shanghai tower is now the tallest but yeah if you've been to uh, dubai you'll see it just shoots up out of the middle of the desert and there's nothing else around it and the other buildings are all really short but yeah it's uh, i i don't know if i fully agree that all tall buildings are egotistical because uh, i don't know you'd have to look at the unit economics of square footage but um that's a hypothesis that sounds compelling to me so you know who built so you know who ended up building the empire state building who was it actually one know. of the one of the primary movers and shakers behind that there were two there was a money guy who came from i want to say general motors or general electric i always get those confused the other was l smith which was the ex governor oh, okay. of new york of new york state which i thought was like what do you do after you've been the governor of a state and like you're retired will you build yourself like the tallest <laughs> building in the city of course um so people know, That's you know funny. anyways um yeah, yeah. it's actually yeah. I think it makes sense because if you actually want to, like just looking at geometry, I've seen like a different class of proponents of urban densification. They have like speculative architectures and they're not full of tall buildings. They're like, if you have like 10, 10 or 15 story buildings, that'll do a better job of increasing density in like half a square mile than 100 uh, story building, right? So, it, okay. So it's like the vanity of the, I don't know, movers and shakers becomes a distortion function on the skyline, right? Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> and like, they all kind of tend to concentrate at the center of town or wherever the place yeah. is. I mean, at this point, Houston has a couple of like, places that large office buildings were built. Like there's the West Galleria area and then there's downtown, but like no one lives downtown. Downtown is like a wasteland. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe that's why I didn't like Houston the one time I visited, but that was again like 20 years ago. So I actually don't remember very much. I've, I've flown through it before, but I've actually been to Houston only once and I don't think I liked it, but well, maybe I'll visit now. I think, well, so the thing about Houston is like, there's, there's like one neighborhood that's very great and I live there. Um, <laughs> and the rest of the city, I think, I mean, I think there's, I think there's other great places in, in Houston. Um, but I don't Wait, think is that uh, Rice University is in Houston, right? It is, yeah. Okay. I live like a few miles from Rice, basically. Oh, okay. So uh, that's the neighborhood I think I hung out in with my friend who uh, I just mentioned who was at McKinsey at the time. So yeah, I went and like couch surfed with him uh, for a night and explored that neighborhood. That was a nice yeah. neighborhood. The yeah, Rice it's a great University neighborhood. One. Yeah. yeah. 
Right. Um, anyways, okay, but I, to go back to Jane Jenkins really quickly, like the thing that, um, so anyways, like everyone knows her for her urbanist stuff, but it's not, and she is on record for saying it's not her most important stuff, and I 100% agree with her. Oh, yeah. The thing that like no one ever reads these books, because like it just eclipses, <laughs> it just eclipses, like it's so much eclipsed by like the popular understanding of her being an urbanist, like reading this book written by economists were like urbanist Jane Jacobs, and you're like, no, man, she is like an economist. Like her, her biggest contributions, I believe, were to our understanding of how economies work. Um, and she really like rewrites how she rewrites like the um, the narrative of like micro and macroeconomics away from what Adam Smith had. Like she directly kind of like counters this whole narrative about where agriculture started. And that's really important because our understanding of how cities and the relationship with agriculture really shapes our understanding of um, where like economic growth comes from. Anyways. Uh, so in uh, systems of survival, so the part of, of that that I know is the uh, guardian versus commerce syndrome. So again, Wikipedia level gloss, but I liked it so much. I made a little table of it. So, you know, a checklist of comparison of the points contrasting the two, but it's basically a cherry picked nugget. I haven't read the book. So I picked out that one piece and used it in a blog post, but what's the sort of story around that? So you're saying she has a theory of agriculture and macro micro. So is oh, this yeah. systems of survival embedded within that larger, big history? No. Systems okay. of survival is a completely separate, I would say it's her most philosophical work. So oh, okay. there's like, um, there's two books that she wrote about econ econ economics. Well, three actually. One okay. of them is like a case study, which is really cool. Um, so the first one is called The Economy of Cities. And that's the one that kind of directly tries to address this like misconception of where agriculture comes from. Got it. She like, so her whole thing is that, um, any like technological progress or new work that gets developed by a society starts in cities um, and then moves out to the countryside. So she uses this hmm. like um, city that was discovered in, I wanna say like the Mesopotamian area, area like, I, um, which super old anyways. Um, and she says the way that agriculture developed there is it started in the city and then moved from small city plots out to just the outside of the city and then spread out from there. Um, but that agriculture, so anyways, her whole idea is that like cities create work and then export it to the countryside. And so there's a, so any new work that gets created, like new fabrication processes or new like making bicycles or like, because cities are where all the people are, they're where all the capital is, they're where there's enough concentration of know-how and understanding to come together to actually build new and innovative processes. And then any of that work then gets exported to larger factories that are located outside of cities because once the like processes develop, they need space or um, other things that you can't get. Okay, so, so that um, process of evolution is very familiar for industry, but it's kind of, you know, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard of this theory of applying it to agriculture that agriculture starts as like little urban backyard farming and then once you figure out how to grow plants you take it out to the countryside where you can scale basically a factory scale farm scale right yeah. yeah so that's right. fascinating yeah so then so she basically and then she has this so basically she says economy like actual economics occur between cities so like the the driver, so the driver of the economy is the work product that a city as a unit. So if you look at economies, like the unit of an economy, like the boundaries of it as being the urban, mm -hmm. urban unit, and then, and maybe it's hinterlands as like, but the hinterlands all have a central city that they're yep. like tied to, like that's where all of their work and like, economic ties are usually to a single like city and I mean this was like back in the day before the internet I think I think it's past time for someone to write an updated version of this that um ties in the stuff like Etsy and um decentralized work projects that like and in terms of like how they're reshaping the ability of innovation to happen mm -hmm. like extra city or non-geographically um, um, though i'm not sure that they are because i think your yeah, um, or exactly. jacob's thesis is actually stronger than even the internet because 
yes, I can, now that you've pointed it out, I can see it applying to um, farming and of course it applies to industry. But if you treat the general hypothesis as urban centers are basically prototyping places for new kinds of production and new, not so innovating work processes basically. So they're prototyping areas for that. Then uh, it's true even of things like Etsy, like uh, this test kitchens uh, for people who want to like do their own like food startup and you only find them in like bigger cities. Or if you want to yeah. go to a maker shop or, you know, find a 3D printer or t something like that, all those like um, things tend to be only in big cities. So even if you want to like scale an Etsy business based on like homemade crafts, unless you're doing something really traditional that's been established for a long time, you probably cannot start in like some remote uh, village. You have to start in some place like, you know, San Francisco, New York, go to a maker space, learn this latest cool toy. And once you've learned it, then you can take it and go to a suburb and build a nice Etsy business there. But to learn it, you I think you have to be it. in the city. Yeah. 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 Right. So then she said like this really interesting thing about like, anyway, she's like, so she develops a whole system around economy. She's like, explain mm -hmm. these economics. Like she has a great, I think she has like a great um, explainer on how the like, currency controls matter for like macroeconomic, like balance between different like city state kind of organizations. Um, she's really anti like single currency and she thinks it has really deleterious effects on the local economies of like different city industries. Like, um, the case, she has a whole book on this case study that's basically the Quebec um, separatist movement, like the attempt of the Quebecois in the 70s mm -hmm. to um, establish their own independent city. And she explains why that would be good for Montreal and how if they stayed in the, if they stayed in Canada under the Canadian dollar regime, how Montreal over time would lose out to Toronto. And I think that has like largely borne out over the last like 30 or 40 years. Montreal has like to a little, to a certain extent, the business activity and economic activity of Montreal has like withered a bit, whereas Toronto has really become like the main um, money center and city of economic activity for like most of that Canadian region. Um, Anyways, and she thinks to that is the common currency because you need, anyway, so she's got like this whole balance of trade and how trade works built on stuff. And that's I, all be, I believe stuff. that. Yeah. I think um, unifying a currency tends to favor like um, the sort of um, already the largest ones, the big get bigger, the ones centralized. This is true of, I think, nationalizing languages and creating standard measurements and uh, creating standard currencies as well. So I, I guess you could say that if uh, Jane Jacobs were working today, then in the crypto world, she would not be a Bitcoin maximalist. She would be uh, let multiple cryptocurrencies flourish kind of person, right? So portfolio type. Okay. Are you a Bitcoin well, maximalist think, or the opposite? I love every fucking weird crypto project. But okay, I like, so I like gonna, okay, I agree on that. here's the thing. <laughs> But here's the thing, like, so not every, not every cryptocurrency project is based around like a, a city state, if that makes sense. So like Jane Jacobs was very like, the currency needs to be associated with like a city, which is like an economic powerhouse, right? Ah, and the it. currency needs to be the tool that that city uses to negotiate its like balance of trade with other city states, so to speak. Um, because huh. it allows you to make sure that like, if you're producing tables in city A and there's tables being produced in city B, that like the cheapness of production or whatever, like just kind of like balances out exactly. She might've been a little bit naive around this and maybe a, to a certain Yeah, I was, I was just about to um, suggest. So I think there's advantages to having that kind of diversity of currency. And they're actually mm -hmm. the same as the uh, argument she had for um, uh, buildings of various ages in, um, uh, cities. It's the same kind of like uh, anti-monoculture diversity robustness, yes, but uh, yes. I don't think it'll actually yeah. get you uh, monetary independence of that sort because what you just uh, mentioned reminds me of this uh, uh, much more recent idea in uh, macroeconomics. I think it's called the Mundell-Fleming trilemma. Have you heard of that? No. Uh, so the Mundell-Fleming trilemma, let me see if I can get this off the top of my head, states that you can only pick two of three. So it's a two of three constraint. And I think it's mm -hmm. Uh, exchange rate, independent monetary policy, and trade balance or something like that. So three variables that determine the relationship of your internal economy with the economy that you're embedded in. So that's the Mundell-Fleming um, trilemma. So by that, I think currencies won't buy you uh, 
much freedom, but they'll buy you a seat at the table where the trade-off is being worked. So that it, so it'll buy you kind of like that kind of political autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Uh, so well, this trilemma thing, did they tie it to cities though, or what was the uh, what was? So the this is uh, no, this is not city like level. Oh, and I'm hearing some echoes. Uh, it's it's nations. So because now nations are the ones that uh, can have um, independent. Uh, but the nation's the wrong level of granularity for currency. The currency should be tied to the economic like, region. Yeah, so the Mandel Fleming whole. trilemma is not. not uh, 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 I'm hearing a bit of echo. Are you hearing an echo? No. Okay. Okay, it stopped now. So the, uh, I just uh, sent you the link, but the Mandel Fleming trilemma is not a speculative theory about currencies that could exist but about monetary regimes that do exist. So today that basically means nations, right? So it's basically uh, things like if you want to analyze uh, China's internal currency versus its yeah, trade the balance, rate you have to do that. Yeah. But this is the whole problem with the way we look at economics <laughs> today is we're looking at it at the wrong level. Like it's the wrong way to look at an economy and attempt to understand it because you're losing information. It's not good fidelity information. Oh yeah, totally. And uh, I've heard versions of this idea cropping up a lot lately. Like I have a friend who's working on the idea that having a federally set central interest rate is actually a terrible thing. And every region and every city should have its own kind of like uh, interest rate and inflation and all that indexed to that. Yes. And uh, so I think you're going to see a lot of that in sort of the post COVID world where already you're seeing a lot of regional autonomy coming up. So we're going to see things yeah. like that. Like um, right now, the only entity that can sort of make the money printer go burr, as the meme says, that's the federal government, right? So California might be uh, managing its affairs well, but it can't like balance its own sort of fiscal deficits by itself because it can't do that, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah and I mean, like, so Jane Jacob is also like, a, and I think I'm also kind of in this boat as like an anti, at least in the United States, like a little bit of an anti-federalist in terms mm -hmm. of like, where does all our tax money go? Like the federal government gets a lot of our tax money when in reality, we should be giving most of our tax money to our cities. Like if the, if you really wanted to drive the economic engines of America, the majority of tax money would be kept locally instead of going to this like patronage, like system that is like the federal government. But I, I don't know. Yeah, that's one I, um, I would say I'm agnostic on. We should talk about that uh, for T, uh, T for taxes or something, because yeah. I go back and forth on that about the kinds of like civilizational stack infrastructure we rely on. Um, a lot of it is honestly not city scale. Like you and I are recording a podcast on the internet. So the internet is like a global slash national scale piece of infrastructure they're using. We're using the product of a company called Zoom that's in a bunch of different places. It's so I, I, I don't know. In a city, oh. though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Starting uh, but, in a city, though. Uh, but the technology it uses probably came out of some federal grant that some university researchers turned into video compression algorithms, blah, 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 right? So it's hard to say where wealth creation is happening in the spatial scale from cities to nations. I, so I'm just not committing to your hypothesis that cities should get the bulk of taxes. So, no, but I'm willing to entertain it. It's the Jamesian hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, but you you seem to be fully behind that one. So, uh, I'm I think it's worth that. like exploring. I feel like it's a theory worth exploring. Um, I feel like I'll, anyway. So like my whole thing with Jane Jacobs is I feel like a lot. She had some really really great insights into econ economics that like no one knows about or ever talks about. Um, which is frustrating. Even like economists are like, oh, urbanist Jane Jacobs. And it's like, yeah, but no. Like you, so, you as an economist don't understand the economy, like contributions of this woman. Like how's anyone else supposed to know? Like you're an expert <laughs> in this field. Like, well, if no. it's too much against their paradigm, then they have like a motivated reason to sort of ignore that. Because if it sort of undermines too many of their assumptions, they kind of have to rewrite their whole thesis. So uh, I understand why they would call, put her in the urbanist no, I think honestly, I think it. I think it says more about like the. Um, I think it says more about like canon as a field. Like Jane Jacobs is not written into the and like remember how I was saying like earlier about how when you go and you look at like what works cite Jane Jacobs. Like Jane Jacobs isn't her economic works aren't cited anywhere. Like they're not. They haven't been like 
like mm. integrated into the canon of what economics are like it's still fucking adam smith like <laughs> It's fucking Adam Smith. It's fucking like who's the other like maybe like some Bentham like um what do you call it like what was that utilitarianism Bentham, like, utilitarianism like yeah, these yeah. are like the like these are the things that like economics today still fucking talk about as like the things that we should use as like um policy predictors. Yeah. Jane Jacobs is not a pillar of the economic tradition, and like as far as I'm concerned, like no one seems interested in like doing that work to make her such. Um, I think it's a real travesty. Yeah. I think that would take like a quantitatively oriented economist to basically take her work and translate it into like uh, uh, the kind of math models that can compete with the incumbent math models. Because the, uh, the problem with economics is that it's a heavily mathematized field, even though it's like, you know, I personally think it's bad mathematics. It's like very apt. Um, math. Yeah, it's a, a spherical cow. Like that's the famous thing they say about, um, you know, economics. It's spherical cow economics. Uh, but before we move on from uh, uh, the uh, urbanism stuff, I should mention that uh, the one thing I've written about cities puts me squarely in the opposite corner from Jane Jacobs. I wrote this uh, uh, blog post called Cloud Mouse, Metro Mouse, where I basically said, all right, there's two kinds of attitudes you can have towards uh, urbanism, which mm -hmm. can be sort of... Uh, uh, characterized by if you go to a new city, you either go to the Starbucks, the nearest Starbucks, or you dig up the, uh, you know, cute indie coffee shop that the city is famous for, and you hunt it out and go there. And I am like 100% find the Starbucks and go park there. Like I will I have zero patience for like uh, uh, finding whatever the city narcissistically thinks of as its sort of uh, local color coffee shop. So uh, I am uh, that way all the way, but that's that's, so that's what I call a cloud mouse and the references to the, you know, the old town mouse, country mouse uh, fable. So I, I turned that into cloud mouse, um, metro mouse. So I, I, I thought I should just sort of register that as uh, uh, my urbanism posture, which is probably an asshole posture. I mean, I don't, I don't quite, I don't quite grasp. So your, your posture is like, you like the commercially legible. I like um, basically a consistent global infrastructure. Mm. Not, it needn't be 100% everywhere, but I like the idea that anywhere I go in the world, there's like a certain percentage of infrastructure that I can already navigate, that I'm already literate in. So Starbucks, blah, blah, blah. Like, um, so, oh, so you're more like a hegemonist. Maybe. Like, uh, in a way, this is sort of the commercial. So we are actually now in the overlap of the commerce uh, guardian and the urbanism stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because if you think about what Starbucks is, it's basically the Robert Moses of coffee, right? It's like building highway systems of coffee through eminent domain of local coffee shops. You don't like that metaphor? No, because, no. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think, like... I mean, maybe like Walmart. I don't think Starbucks and Walmart are quite the same. Wait, is this because you like Starbucks? Do you go to Starbucks? I never go to Starbucks, no. Oh, you don't? Starbucks. Okay. So where do you go? What's your preferred coffee shop? I don't drink. Uh, there's a couple local ones that are like within oh, okay. So, so, so I don't drink coffee, so. Whatever your beverage of choice is. But is it? Okay, so it's not coffee. Decaf, usually, if I have to, like, get something. It's just, I love coffee. I just can't handle it. Uh, though uh, I'm exaggerating, I do go to local coffee shops as well as uh, Starbucks in general, but it has to be something special or interesting for me to go local. But um, I mean, yeah. It, okay, anyway, so just uh, thought I should register that. But all right, so oh, we're almost at an hour already. So do we want to... out of time. So, we should talk about jokes, though, maybe briefly. Like, do like five minutes, and then if you have to go, we should go. All right, so let's do a quick take on jokes. I was, I've re recently been watching um, The Orville. Have you watched The Orville? I've not even heard of that. Oh, it's like uh, a so, kind of popcorn? Like. No, no, The Orville. <laughs> Orville Redenbacher, no. The Orville is basically started off as a parody of Star Trek. And okay. it's by the guy who did Family Guy, uh, I forget, Seth MacFarlane. So it's Seth Mar MacFarlane's, um, it started off as a Star Trek parody and eventually it sort of went through this fake it till you make it thing till it became like as good as the Star Trek franchise. But the only difference between the two is it's like almost perfectly execution of the Star Trek formula except for jokes. Like randomly there are like stupid jokes sprinkled throughout the script. 
which I find hilarious. So yeah. anyway, so that's my one thought on jokes. What are, okay, what are the jokes add? Like, okay, what what does the jokes add to that experience though? Like, okay, so it's like Star Trek, but with jokes. Like, what is the what they don't add anything. Them? That's been actually one of the criticisms of uh, Seth MacFarlane, where uh, I remember, I think, was it South Park? <laughs> South Park did a sort of a um, show on Family Guy, basically with Cartman making this argument that Family Guy sucks. All it is is like a series of like uh, non secretor jokes strung together with like no coherent reason for the jokes. So it's like, and, and that's true. If you watch a couple of episodes of Family Guy, there's no larger sort of comic thesis or like a narrative or anything. It's just like, mm -hmm. um, it's almost like a George Carlin stand-up set, like a series of machine gun style jokes without a broader sort of uh, theme to it. So unless the jokes are super brilliant, that style doesn't work. Like jokes have to be placed in the context of sort of a larger narrative arc to work if they're like ordinary jokes. But if you're really like brilliant, like George Carlin, maybe you can make like just a series of jokes work. But yeah, McFarlane's uh, joke series didn't work in Family Guy. But I think I overall liked the guy. Like, um, Orville is a good show. It's, it's fun. It's a good show, but the jokes are not. Active. And the jokes are funny jokes, but they're like just there. They don't move the plot along. They're not central to sort of the way the subject is treated. So it's not. So if you have you watched Galaxy Quest? No. Okay, so again, so I'll describe both to you. So Galaxy Quest is a parody of Star Trek in movie form, but that was an mm -hmm. actual parody, right? So it took these sort of deep tropes and narrative conceits of Star Trek and sort of worked to under the, undermine them at like a very basic level and sort of created like a two hour movie on top of it. So the basic premise of Galaxy Quest is there's a Star Trek like show and there are real aliens who from a distance have been sort of receiving transmissions of the Star Trek like show and believe it to be like true documentaries of, uh, of oh. a brave spacefaring civilization on earth. Wait, so course. when their civilization gets into trouble, they come and find the sort of crew of the TV show and say, you must come save our um, planet from this destruction. So the fake crew becomes a real crew and you know, that becomes a premise for playing with a lot of Star Trek's conceits. So that's okay. Galaxy Quest and that's a true like deep parody of uh, Star Trek itself. Whereas Seth MacFarlane's um, Orville is, it's basically straight up just Star Trek, but with like a random like uh, fart joke in the middle. <laughs> That's all it is. So it, the jokes don't actually integrate well into why you're doing the show at all. But they're like cute. It's, <laughs> they don't detract from the show either. They're funny enough on their own. So it's just like randomly, all right. It's almost like commercial breaks, except joke breaks. So that's what <laughs> it is. But, uh, but that's, so, uh, okay. So what else do you have to say about jokes? I, I guess jokes are more like, to me, they're like a kid thing. Like kids love jokes, like elephant jokes and, you know, dad jokes are meant for kids, that kind of thing. But I think when people grow into adults, their taste for jokes turns into taste for like, um, sort of a more gestalt of humor, where you want humor and sort of the overall attitude towards life as expressed through a work of fiction or something. Uh, at least I, like, do you tell jokes anymore? Like I used to tell jokes to my friends as a kid, but I no longer tell jokes. Like if you asked me to tell a joke, I would like struggle now. But if you asked me to like uh, try and write a funny 3000 word story, I could take a reasonable stab at that. Like I can't try to write like a isolated joke by itself. Like even stand-up comics don't do that anymore, right? Their entire set tends to be like, start with the premise and then build and build and build. And there's joke moments, but it's not a string of jokes. It's unless you're George Carlin. Yeah. Style, right? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm going to have to go watch some Carlin now because it sounds amazing. I mean, I've seen some yeah. clips of him and he's just brilliant. Um, uh, he yeah, does it I mean, consciously though, I think. He very deliberately decided that he's yeah. so good at just the joke that he can do the yeah. machine gun style jokes. So, hundred percent, I believe that. But okay, so like, I think you can see this happening on Twitter. Um, there is a definite, it's like, there's definitely joke Twitter that I like follow a couple people from. But, and it's like you can like you can like delve deep into joke Twitter. It's like a bunch of people telling jokes on their profiles twenty four seven, and uh -huh. I like all hang out together. It's like joke corner. Um, <laughs> I follow a couple of them because I thought they were pretty good, but after a while, they do get a little like, it's almost like a certain amount of, 
I like lose that sensation. It like is numbing to an mm-hmm. extent. Yep. Like too much of the joke just becomes like your brain just kind of like fuzzes in a weird way. Um, yeah. Which is different than like, what was the example I was going to make? Uh, there was a comedian I wanted to bring up and ask about. Um, which one was it? I don't remember. Anyways. Um, whereas like, there's like other types of humor that I'm really into. Like I love certain stand-up comics, but they don't tell they don't tell jokes the same way. It's not like jokes. It's mm-hmm. like narrative stories that are entertaining. Yep. And I think that style probably shifted in the mid '90s or something. Um, so yeah. I, there's been like lots of waves of this and there's always been like a tradition of like character based comedy where you play a particular character and the jokes yeah, flow good. from that character and I think that yeah, was where it started uh, but then it went into this sort of more jokey mode and then it seems to at some point have gone observational and then from observational to cringe so there's like these eras of um, stand up comedy but I don't think yeah. there was ever like an era that was like pure jokey and uh, like comedians who are too jokey, they get actually call, called out on that. Like there's actually an episode in Seinfeld where Elaine calls out um, Jerry for being too jokey. Like she's trying to write a little comic panel for the New Yorker and mm-hmm. Jerry suggests an opposite, uh, like alternate ending to that panel. And she's like, why do you, why, do, why, does, why does your stuff always have to be so jokey? And I, I think that's a real thing. Like jokey is sort of a characteristic of a style of humor, which is uh, not a very good style of humor. Mm. right it's not what makes it not good though like when you say it's not good is that because it's like not like there's but it doesn't i don't know so if you look at like a classic joke with its sort of uh, three-step structure like uh there's like a setup and then there's like a middle part and then there's the punchline and if you look yeah. at how modern stand-up comics actually integrate jokes into like a larger set, they typically have a four-step process where the really good jokes are like told the first time with like uh, the typical immediate 30-second three-step thing. But then the actual punchline comes like 20 minutes later when they do a call back to the original telling, right? Yeah. But that requires you to be building up a team across those 20 minutes where it kind of at least integrates together. Otherwise, right? it's like, it's narrative. Yeah. It's narrative. Exactly. You need a narrative. It's narrative like framework. Okay. So that makes sense. So like yeah. I guess I think we've like kind of established that like jokes that don't have this narrative quality to them are lesser than the narrative jokes, maybe. Yeah. And you, you can dispense with the jokes entirely if you have the right sort of humorous uh, narrative posture. Like I think yeah. I'm fairly funny on Twitter, but I don't think I actually ever tell jokes. I just sometimes say funny things that are funny in the context of my overall sort of uh, tweet stream, right? And the same thing with um, you. I mean, uh, I think you're a funny tweeter, and but it's in the context. Like one of your uh, tweets I like is that uh, one I mentioned before about very sinister tweeting going on here. And oh, that yeah. kind of fits in your flow of your general sort of style on uh, Twitter, right? So it kind of has to fit. So it's both you're playing a character and sort of, saying things that are funny in context yeah i think that makes sense i actually so i have one more anecdote and then we maybe if you don't have anything else to add we should close it out Mm -hmm. um but the so when i lived in san francisco for a while for a good while i was going to oh man i was kind of like running a meta joke on top of this that we can talk about later but Mm -hmm. like every sunday i would go to watch the same stand-up comedy show Um, And it was kind of like a variety. So like they'd have like maybe eight different performers and like five of them would be the same. And the five that were the same would tell the same set (laughs) with some variation. So there was like a little bit, there'd be like two or three like acts that were different always. But like the core of it was always the same set. Mm -hmm. So when you see like the same comedian doesn't give, like a stand-up comic doesn't come up with like a new 10 minute set every week. They like Mm -hmm. really only do the same thing. It was the fucking best thing. I I would go watch the same jokes every week and just have a ball like laughing at the same stuff. And like, (laughs) I don't know what it was. Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like that's like, 
I don't know that everyone would enjoy that is what I guess I'm saying. Like, I mean, I was pretty good about not, oh. I would like, I don't know how my brain would like forget. Like I would, you know enough about what joke was coming that I would, I was pretty good about not laughing. Before I, I, got I think it joke. might yeah. work with uh, stand up comedy. That's not too dependent on surprise. So the one uh, mm -hmm. set that I enjoy watching over and over again, I think there's a couple like that. Um, one is uh, Louis Black, the um, angry ranting uh, guy. Uh, so he huh. started out on The Daily Show and um, so he's an older guy and he plays this sort of persona of like a really angry, frustrated old guy jokes. And it's not, there's no sort of a surprising punchlines in his things, but he just plays that extremely about to explode frustrated character so well that you can watch that set over and over again. And, yeah. um, and other things are enjoyable in the same way. Like Dana Carvey is one of the best um, impersonation comics around, like previous generation. Like I think mm -hmm. it was an SNL 90s or something, but excellent um, uh, sort of impressions. And impressions are something you can sort of um, enjoy over and over again. But uh, here's a counter example though. Like um, Jerry Seinfeld has a new uh, stand-up special on Netflix or something, but he also had one like a year ago or something. I haven't watched the new one, but this is about the one about a year or two ago. And that was sort of his sort of, I don't know, come back to the stand-up scene, kind of like comeback uh, tour. And it was really, really disappointing because what he did was he went back to his entire career, going back to the late 80s, mined all his best material. So it was like a greatest hits of Jerry Seinfeld kind of set for like 45 minutes. But it all kind of fell completely flat to me because the context of the 90s was missing. Like, he was funny in the context of what was going on then and repeating those jokes in like 2017 or whenever it was, it was like, this doesn't work. So the counter example there is I think the narrative context had shifted too much. So you have to have new material if you're working in like two decades later comedic context. Oh, hopefully his new set is better. I don't know. I mean, that sounds like it's just a complete ego play. Like, I'm just going to replay all my best hits. Like. It, it didn't come across like that. It was more like a fond memoir or something. So he interspersed his set with, like, reminiscences of, like, him starting out, like, back in the days of, like, early New York comedy scene. So it was something, like, almost, um, I don't know. It, it wasn't an ego trip. It was more like a memoir a nostalgia uh, thing. thing. Yeah, it, it, was an all, it was a nostalgia comedy thing, except I don't think it worked. Like, it, it, it just didn't evoke laughs for me, but maybe it did for others. But um, anyway, all right. So we, have we exhausted the topic of jokes? I don't feel like we told enough jokes for this segment, <laughs> but that's fine. We made a case that jokes are a bad form of humor, so we don't have to tell jokes. There we go. Just sticking <laughs> to our principles. I like it. All right, great. Yep. Uh, well, Venkat, it was always a pleasure to talk to you on Scarpia season. All right. Great having you on, Lisa. So I'll see you again next week. All right. Take care. Bye. Right. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.